Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. Today, we've got another incredible episode. I know you guys were preparing for me to say that it's only going to be merely okay episode or even a mediocre episode, but once again, it is going to be an incredible episode today. Of course, we're mostly going to be talking about Ukraine today, but I have some special news for you guys. If you guys are the really dedicated Greer heads out there, you remember last year we got a terrific correspondence from uh, the highly respected foreign correspondent, Liam Strumpet. And, you know, we've been trying to get him into these hot zones around the world. You know, we've been trying to get him into Afghanistan. We didn't get him there. We got him into Israel last year during the Palestinian-Israel conflict last summer. Uh, But we've been trying to get him into Ukraine. And finally, finally, we got Liam into Ukraine to deliver a terrific, I mean, really powerful report from on the scene in Ukraine, and this is something you're not going to hear anywhere else. So sit back and really, you know, this will this may bring tears to your eyes. So uh, I do want to have a content warning for you guys. So here's Liam Strumpet's report from Kiev. He he made a point to say he, he's reporting from Kiev. <laughs> Kiev, Ukraine. That is the sound of gunfire and warfare going on around me as the Ukrainian people fight for their survival. <laughs> Slava Ukraini! The Ukrainian people fight on defiantly even though the odds are outnumbered against them. I interviewed one local soldier whose name is Olga Levchenko. She has managed to destroy at least 30 tanks with nothing more than a slingshot shooting pickles. Dubai, I am just a little girl from my village, and I am out here to defend my nation called Ukraine. Ukraine is strong and powerful and will defeat the Muscovites. Olga spends most of her time out in the trenches stocking up on more pickles, as well as running a popular Instagram account called Ukrainian Black Sun Batty. <laughs> Olga gets the name for her Instagram account from the patch she wears on her vest. It appears to look as a spinning wheel, but she says it is a Black Sun, a traditional symbol, Ukrainian symbol for peace and love. Olga says that many Ukrainian soldiers wear the similar patch in order to inspire them to know what they are fighting for. She says she hopes to live in a country full of peace one day where she can pursue her dream of interior design. But, like all Ukrainian people, her dreams are so far thwarted by one man in Moscow, namely Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. I'm Liam Strumpet, reporting from Kiev, Ukraine. Back to you, Scott. Wow, that was a really powerful report from Liam Strumpet. Uh, you know, but I do, you know, I don't want to criticize Liam Strumpet's uh, journalism too much, but I, I, I don't think he uh, got an honest answer from Olga about her uh, black sun patch. But, uh, you know, you know, war zone, fog of war, we can't really, uh, you know, fault him too much for not getting an honest answer from L- Olga. So we hope that Olga can... Uh, Pursue her dream and interior design, and you know maybe uh, yeah. Ho- well, hopefully she uh, has some good optics housing uh, for the Ukrainian people in the future. So yeah, we, uh, we this is highly respected. We have our own foreign correspondent on the ground in in Kiev. Even though you know Liam was wanting to call it Ki- Kiev, uh, but you know highly respected editorial guidelines. We're gonna stick with Kiev because that's what Americans were calling it for many many years beforehand. So after that report, we're going to have to jump into what's going on in Ukraine and where to start. There's just so many new things to talk about from the conflict. Um, you know, it is grinding along. I think now the media is realizing that, you know, a chance of a military victory for Ukraine is slim to none at this moment. Uh, I think Ukraine and Russia are saying their negotiations are going much better. Hopefully a peace deal is reached soon and the war can end and lives can go on as before or, or hopefully even better than before and that there's a peace deal that would ensure that there's no more conflict for a, a long time to come. But yeah, it is going well. And I think yesterday, you know, over the weekend, there was a uh, 
training compound that was hit that had a lot of foreign volunteers. We really can't. I want to say this, like for everything with Russia and Ukraine, you don't know what is true. You, But from what it's been gathered is that this spooked, well, killed a lot of people who were at this facility. A lot of foreign volunteers were there and it has spooked a lot of them. And now a lot of them are leaving, supposedly. Uh, there's also reports that they're that is a lot of what I've been saying on the podcast that's saying like the one problem with a lot of these guys who are signing up to be born volunteers is that Ukraine is going to rush them to the front lines and hope something bad happens to them in order to generate the hope or to help out the hope that the West will intervene to help out their soldiers who are killed, wounded or captured in this conflict. You know, their own citizens who this may happen to. And, you know, some of the reports that are eking out on Reddit and elsewhere are saying that this is what Ukraine is doing. They're giving them hardly any training and they're throwing them straight to the front lines. And a lot of these guys, one person in particular, we can't necessarily verify whether this is 100 percent true or not. But, you know, it sounds relatively true due to the guys posting history is that, you know, they're not giving these people any training and they're trying to rush them up as quick as possible and what they are really feeling like is that they're cannon fodder, literally, truly cannon fodder, just to be bodies there to catch, um, you know, cruise missiles and stuff. And a lot of guys don't want to do this. And even a lot of combat veterans from the West, you know, don't really have experience with that because, you know, the West has had uh, air superiority in every conflict that we've been in, in, you know, over the last 20 years or so. And, you know, this is something very new. And they're like, uh, you know, I'm, I didn't sign up for this. So I'm going home. Uh, so we'll have to see how that turns out. Um, you know, the, the negotiations are apparently getting more productive. So that's a good sign. As I've said before, you know, I don't think America necessarily wants the PCO. I mean, what America wants is, well, by America, I mean, of course, uh, the globalist American empire and the Biden administration, the State Department, CIA, etc., is that they want Ukraine to turn into Afghanistan. They want a long insurgency that gets Russia bogged down and Russia is spending a lot of lives and money on this conflict. And then it drags the Putin regime down with it. And that's necessarily their goal. But I don't necessarily think that they're, I say necessarily a lot. People are no, noticing I say necessarily a lot, but it's my key phrase. I just remembered that. And it's not that America would be that opposed to it, that they would say, tell Zelensky is like, no police peace deal. I think they would realize like, OK, we'll take a peace deal, but, you know, whatever deal you're going to make. And maybe you won't be in NATO, but we're going to still supply you with a ton of weaponry and send you a bunch of tr guys to train your military. And, you know, maybe we even might have some secret weapons facilities there, but for all intents and purposes, you're not going to join NATO, but you're sort of going to be quasi NATO and we're definitely going to be supplying you with a lot of firepower and giving you a lot of economic aid. And we're going to have a lot of control and influence over your country, regardless of whether you're in NATO or not. And I think that's what, that the deal they're going to send. And they're also going to realize that a lot of Ukrainian people probably have a more negative impression of Russia uh, from this. I'll get to this in a moment, but, uh, you know, with... They, they, I don't know necessarily if they want, they would take the idea of not dealing with insurgency. The groups that really want the insurgency are the Ukrainian nationalist militias. And a lot of them are in the process of getting surrounded and, you know, neutralized at the moment in the West. And that's the main reason that they have not reached a peace deal is that Zelensky is worried that if he made a peace deal now and these nationalist militias are still intact, still having a lot of numbers that they could easily overthrow him in a coup. And I think he's waiting until they get wiped out in, in Donbass, near Donbass, to you know move ahead and say, OK, Russia, we'll make a deal. And as long as he's secure in knowing that he won't have to be removed by these national militias for whatever power or whatever peace deal he makes, he will go ahead and do it. What would a peace deal look like? That is an interesting question. I mean, what Russia seems to be doing is that they're trying to create these similar independent oblasts that they'll turn in republics. They're trying to do that in Kherson. Uh, I'm sure they're going to do that in the in the republic that's next to or the oblast that's near. I'm probably even mispronouncing oblast, but I don't give a shit. I once again, I'm tired of these Slavic things. I don't know Slavic and we'll just call them oblast. I'm sure that's not how you pronounce it, but oblast or oblast. 
I don't really care. But these regions or provinces, states, we'll call them states. You know, they'll the state next to the Donetsk Republic, they'll probably uh, annex and they'll probably go for both Donetsk and Luhansk to their previous existing boundaries. I don't know if they'll be able to make one out of Kharkov, but maybe they'll try. And so it'll be interesting to see what they want to do. I don't think they're going to get what they may have set out to do. I think that with Russia, there's a lot of talk as like, you know, Russia has been failing and they've had miscalculations. And I think from a political perspective, yeah, they have miscalculated. I think the Ukrainian people are definitely not eager to be invaded by Russia. I mean, regardless of whatever you think of the, the, the war or America's involvement, it is pretty clear that a very strong majority of Ukrainians are, are even more so now much more hostile to Russia. I don't even think if they took Kiev or Kiev, they would be able to install a puppet government that would be recognized by the people or <laughs> much any more so than like a minority out east. You know, I think the majority of the people are, you know, they may have had Russian sympathies before or especially so eight years ago during Maidan. I mean, most of the east, they were attempts to, you know, create these all these independent republics out in eastern Ukraine and only two uh examples worked or only two republics worked in the end uh, they really shut down the attempts to do that in odessa and, and harkov so it looks like that any peace deal would be just acknowledging the facts on the ground crimea is going to be part of russia they're going to have to recognize the independence of at least two republics maybe new ones i don't know how they'll successful will they be in creating other ones and probably eventually these republics will be part of russia uh, or maybe or maybe they'll just keep them as these independent republics. I mean, Russia does like doing this in many other areas that used to be part of the Soviet Union. They'll have their own little independent state that's uh, supposed to be a part of another state, but Russia keeps it on its side. All these facts notwithstanding, I think the point is, is that they're not going to be able to have Ukraine in its sphere are the way that they want it to be in its sphere. I mean, they really, they were trying to do its own type of EU and Ukraine is not going to be part of that EU. Ukraine is trying to join the, Ukraine is trying to join the EU and it's going to be, for, what is left of Ukraine that Russia doesn't take with it is going to be even more Western oriented um, at the end of this war. And that's something, I mean, maybe if they have like a neutralized Ukraine, because Ukraine is going to be, screwed heavily screwed after the war there's gonna to be tons of damage i mean they blew up a bunch of bridges they're gonna need a ton of investment and the west will probably come and do its own little type of new marshall plan for ukraine have ngos in charge and they'll likely turn it into a playpen for these ngos to do all these weird experiments in ukraine and to bring mass migration in there and a lot of these nationalists may have been eliminated by the war and or they could be pass, passing laws in order to arrest them on hate speech or other things and that people like Zelensky and these liberals that are approved by the west take charge of the, of the country and steer it in a direction guided by these ngos so i don't even see it as emerging as even something like hungary or ukraine which are both desperate for western aid despite the good things that they do uh, less so, uh, Hungary more so, or Poland more so than Hungary in that regard. But I don't even see that happening. I think it's just going to be like this state that is entirely dictated by the West. And it is what it is. I mean, the Ukrainians prepared to want that more than to be run by Russia. So, you know, it's not, it's not our... <laughs> That's that's our you know that's what they want. I, I don't think it's necessarily good for us in America that that's happening. That they're strengthening um, the global order, but you know that's what they're choosing. A lot of Ukrainians don't realize that they think that this is about national independence and national self determination and getting away from this power that has occupied them for many many years, and they view as a worse enemy than the West, and they're signing up for something else. But you know. New master, but different problems. And maybe these problems may be equal to Russia. They may be worse, but the Ukrainians are just going to have to figure that out on their own. And the second point I want to say is that sort of onto this matter is, is the question of who to support in this war. And people have really what ordinary support, you know, it doesn't really matter 
unless you're an idiot and going over to sign up to be cannon fodder for the Ukrainians, there are some people signing up to be for the Russians. Not many, but there are some. But, you know, <laughs> this is not your war. Uh, a lot of these people are saying you're not going to retrieve their bodies, so it's not very smart to go over there to be used as a, as a pawn in someone else's game. It's not like even fighting for your own country. I even say, like, going over to Iraq and Afghanistan. At least you're, you know... Maybe not fighting for your country's right interests, but you're still technically fighting for your country and they are going to bring your body back and, you know, have services for you if something bad happens to you. Uh, not the case in Ukraine. And, you know, the American government makes sure you have a lot of training and expertise and are put in a solid organization before sending you out to combat, at least. Uh, not the case in Ukraine. So I think you're and you're not getting hit by cruise missiles uh, from the Taliban. So uh, those are the differences there. Uh, but that aside, I think as I want to really make this point is that neutrality is the real option here. I think that some people are going, you know, they're either going, you know, putting Ukraine flags in or they're putting Russian flags. And he, no, you got it. It's always American flags. And I always even said this, even when you know, there were people when the Soleimani strike happened in early 2020. Uh, that was the Iranian general who had spearheaded a lot of these efforts against ISIS and other groups in Iraq and Syria, uh, considered a hero by the Iranian people, and Trump took him out. And that happened. I thought it was stupid at the time. I think we overestimated its impact. It turned out to not really matter. I still think it was, you know, it was a gamble, but is a gamble that paid off for for Trump. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with the decision, but it wasn't that big of a deal. But all these people on the right uh, then began adopting Iranian flag moniker uh, and their usernames and talking about how awesome Iran is. And I'm like, you're basically just kind of declaring yourself as like, I am a traitor or um, I am not necessarily a traitor. I don't want to use that because one person who uh, adopted Iranian flag and their handle is now calling other people traitors for uh, not supporting the EU and NATO. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he's uh, resentful that he's been ostracized from the right and is just fantasizing that the U.S. government is going to arrest all his enemies on the right and he can finally return to uh, <laughs> in relevance, which is not going to happen. I don't want to name this person because this person hasn't been relevant in four years. But, you know, this, uh, you know, if you want to listen more about him, you can go on to the highly respected IQ supplements and learn about the history of the old right if you want to know more about this person. But his name doesn't deserve to be mentioned on the uh, on the regular episode. Anyway, this person was pro-Iran, and now he's t doing that with uh, calling people traitors for not supporting the EU and NATO. I don't want to go for it, but it is like saying, you know, it is deeply off-putting to normal Americans to be like, we're just anti-war, and just, you're like waving around an Iranian flag. Or they love to add like Iranian flag, North Korea flag, China flag, like Cuba sometimes, Venezuela, and it's like all these flags that like the ordinary Republican voter is going to be like, I hate these countries. I see these countries as my enemies. You know, maybe it might be wrong to see them as their enemies, but I mean, some of them it's right to see their enemies. I mean, I don't know what the argument for North Korea is, except for extreme contrarianism. And even like China is ultimately not our friend. And people just like love flaving, waving these flags around as kind of being like a rebellious teenager, even though they're in their 30s. It doesn't establish you as an American nationalist. It just establishes you as a weirdo and a contrarian. It's an extreme contrarian. As somebody who is hostile to the interest, to what the ordinary middle American thinks. And you're just out there just kind of being like a rebel. I am different. I am so different. Look at all the flags in my bio. And you can always see this with anybody with like a 5%. <laughs> name or uh, five percent in their bio or username that they'll all have these like weird ass flags in there and uh, i want to point this out with like that's like becoming like a lot of the pro-russia stuff to the west i don't necessarily think this is a good thing but it is what's happening is that now more americans and more westerners in general right or left are going to view Russia in a negative light. And a lot of these people have like good views. A lot of these people are mostly solid on if you're talking about immigration, if you're talking about crime, if you're talking about even like race, a lot of these people are probably going to be more open to our ideas. But when it comes to Russia, 
you know, they don't view Russia as a good guy. And even some of these people have made, been making these points. I don't necessarily fully agree with this. That saying that like America and a lot of Europe have always sided with the underdog in these fights. And they see Ukraine as the underdog. And there's been a couple of uh, examples of this. During the Winter War, Finland versus the Soviet Union, a lot of people were on the side of Finland on this. Um, you know, in the 19th century, going back to all the way back then, the 1848 you know, Americans sided with the revolutionaries and they thought this Hungarian named Kossuth, I'm probably slightly mispronouncing his name, but I am not going to properly pronounce him Magyar. <laughs> he was a huge celebrity in America and like Americans loved him. And he was like this Hungarian revolutionary. He came over in the early 1850s and was urging America to get involved in this stuff. And America, there were some Americans who were like, yeah, let's get involved. And then there were others like, uh, no, 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 no. This is a very bad idea. You guys can like Kossuth, but you are not getting involved in this. And you could see this time and time again that they've always sympathized with the plights of these little countries, Belgium and World War One. A lot of that was also similar level of propaganda that was being pumped in, like these stories about Germans just like slaughtering families and all these things that turned out to be not true. Uh, but the people were on this. So it's a natural inclination. Even people make the argument that even without the propaganda, people would side with Ukraine. I think that's generally if you even had like less ratification most Americans still would side with Ukraine. But right as now, it it's like over 80% of the American population views the Ukrainians as the good guys and says we should supply weapons and aid to them, like 84%. And I think the amount of Americans who say we should side with Russia or <laughs> in this conflict is uh, very minimal. <laughs> It's probably it's in many ways the same way as this polling that was done in 1940 about World War II. And this is irregardless of whether America should have been involved in this. This is simply asking, which side do you prefer in the war? And over 80% was saying the Allies, and it was 2% <laughs> saying the Axis. And this is considering a large German and Italian population we have in the country, and only 2% uh, were siding, had a positive opinion about the Axis. And it's a similar case here. And a lot of people are like, well, we need, you know, the truth is on the Russia side, but it is like, the main point to just say is it's not our problem. America helped provoke this by giving uh, undue encouragement to the Ukrainians that they could resist and that they should not give into a deal. And this has led to a stupid conflict that has ultimately strengthened the globalist American empire. You know, Europe is pledging allegiance to it. They're, they're signing up for the sanctions that we're demanding that they sign up for they're increasing their military budget they're doing what we and they're more committed to nato and these international agreements than they were ever before thanks to this conflict and you know in a lot of in many ways we're ensuring that ukraine will be permanently outside of russia's fear due to this conflict so in, in some respects it is benefiting american or at least the gays interests uh, people paying high gas prices. I don't think it is, but <laughs> they are going along with this. And so there is no real benefit to, you know, this conflict to being like saying like, oh, I'm pro Putin. I love Russia and be going into Russia affiliate. I'm actually very much opposed to this because Russia is, it's similar to like being a leftist in the late seventies and being pro Soviet union. It's, makes you very weird and it ensures you stay ghettoized and just like no one listens to you that by just like you know waving around a russia flag and just like really loving putin and, and russia and there's like things to like admire and like putin that you do have a strong leader i mean there is a lot of corruption in russia but whatever uh but going to the point of just like i stand with russia and i am a, a full-blown russia supporter not the wisest move, not the wisest move. And there is going to come a case where they are going to start, you know, going after these people and targeting these people for foreign espionage or, you know, siding with the enemy. And they, America has a long history of doing this against people who are engaged in these activities throughout the Cold War. They did this and they would love nothing more than to get dissidents to openly ally themselves and work directly with Russia in order to get them to, you know, have laws that they can use to spy on them and prosecute these people. So, you know, neutrality is the real is the real argument here. 
you know, you got to we understand that the global American empire is working against our interests, that all these people are Reddit brain and getting and our domestic enemies are all with Ukrainian national flags and seeing Ukraine's fight as their own and applying this or seeing this war through the through the conflict of domestic tensions. And that's how they're why they're so supportive of Ukraine. They see them as the brave little noble POC fighting against white supremacy, even though uh, as we all know, listeners to know this, this is a little bit more complicated than that. But at the same time, you know, we should, you know, push back against that and, and the Ukraine hysteria. But we should resist the temptation of Russia philia are going all in and being like, oh, we love Russia because once again, we're America first. We're, we're American nationalists. We're not Russian nationalists. We're not Russians. You know, Russia's interests are not our own. They're doing their own thing. It's nice that, you know, they're able to resist the GAE and, you know, that they are able to do some sensible things for their own country. But, you know, their country is not our own. Their country, their interests are different from ours. And, you know, aligning yourself with them is now going to be equivalent to be an open, almost going to be equivalent to be an open North Korea fan <laughs> or these other countries that are ostracized by the West. So when choosing to pick whether a Russia or Ukraine flag for your handle or username, uh, let's go with neither. If you're going to pick a flag, just go with the American flag if you're an American. There are some European and non-American listeners, so just go with the country, your native country, your real country. Don't, don't get, you know, feel like these foreign countries are representing you or not, or whatever. They're not. Uh, that doesn't mean, also, absolutely do not do an EU or NATO flag. Like, I know those are uh, absolutely not representative of us. Those are hostile institutions, but at the same time, you know, Russia is not our country. Their their fight is not our, our is not ours. And to the people we're trying to reach and went over to our side, you know, waving a Russia flag is now going to be near the equivalent of waving a Chinese flag or a Venezuelan flag or even possibly a North Korean flag. Maybe not that far, but it's like it's basically just a way of making yourself more distasteful, alienating ordinary people. Unfor I mean, I do think it's unfortunate that you know there should be a degree of a uh, level of sympathy for russia or understanding of russia more than say china or north korea but that's the way the world works and it is just a way of just further ghettoizing ourselves and ostracizing ourselves in the american public because the american public is all 100 percent on board with the ukrainian people and as long as we don't get into war, uh, that's what they're, the Americans about. As long as they can just stick to virtue signaling and that. Yeah, I know the marvelization of the conflict is ridiculous. These redditors are, are uh, outrageous and all of our domestic enemies are on the side of Ukraine. But that does not mean we should just as an act of, you know, being super contrarian or just like flipping them off to just adopt Russian flag to just counter signal them. You should instead adopt the our flag, which is the American flag or our other American symbols. So that's just something to keep in mind as the conflict goes on. So I have a couple of other things to talk about the conflict before going on to different subjects. One thing I want to bring attention to are these Eastern European diaspora that is demanding that we fight their wars in America. Like when we've seen these protests that are going on throughout the country and even in Europe, a lot of people think that there are, these are primarily libtards who are doing this. And I do think there are some libtards, but there are actually Eastern Europeans immigrants who are there who are waving their own flags and demanding that America serve their homeland's interests while they're not living in their homeland, they're living in America. And I learned this when I remember went to a Maidan or protest in support of Maidan in February of 2014 when I just started working at the Daily Caller. I was expecting it's like it's going to be weird neocons and people working at like Heritage Foundation and AEI. And then I go there and it's all Eastern Europeans, all of them with waving their own little flags and stuff. And I know people who've been to recent protests elsewhere and they've gone and it's like all guys, Eastern Europeans, like pretty much no 
like Americans there. It's like all Eastern European immigrants. You can even tell this when they bring the Bandera flags. Like no American is bringing the Bandera flags. It's like the red and black flag that some people think are like an Antifa flag. Uh, no, it, it's a Ukrainian nationalist flag. Uh, only <laughs> Eastern Europe, only Ukrainians, real, real, genuine Ukrainians are we waving that flag. And even that's what we've seen in these protests elsewhere. And they get really hyped up about this stuff. And it's like all about their own country. It is like jarring because it's like, you know, what are you doing here? Like waving these flags and acting like America is a guest spot. It is nice that they're like different from other immigrants. You know, they set themselves up as like different from other immigrants. But they're just like here and like emphasizing this foreign identity as above their own attachment to the United States. And the United States just exists to serve the interest of their little tiny little homeland to do whatever it pleases. Thomas77, a good friend of the podcast who you guys might be hearing from soon on an IQ supplement, had a really good take about this. And this is about the Eastern European diaspora, even though he didn't uh, specific, specify this. He did specify it in reply. He said, people are going to get salty about me. You got to remember that Thomas 77 loves using the caps lock uh, for certain words. Some people are going to get salty about me dropping this, but it explains everything about what is broke about this country that what remains of white Chicago is perfectly okay with the slow destruction of the city by the pathetic, pitiful, Miss Lightfoot yet go berserk over Ukraine. And a lot of these Eastern Europeans have had large demonstrations in Chicago talking about how they need a no-fly zone or whatever, demanding it. Uh, America serves their homeland. And then in a, in a reply to somebody else saying it's like, uh, you know, this person saying a lot of white Americans have for years seen more concerned with foreign affairs than growing crises at home, and it's, and it's screwing us over. Uh, Thomas 77 <laughs> notices that these aren't necessarily white Americans. He says, immigrants are also ingrates. They don't give a fuck. AF. Uh, we're trying to keep this a family program, but I guess we'll let that F bomb uh, go away. <laughs> they think America is an ATM machine slash mercenary force for hire to assist them in their bigoted little endeavors and these crummy failed states they fled from. And 100% true bullseye response of what we're seeing these protests from. And like, you know, it's cool to have national pride, but you're now in America now, and none of these people are assimilating to being, like, ordinary ethnic Americans. They're just, like, emphasizing their Ukrainians. I mean, in part, is that America doesn't offer an alternative identity besides, like, McDonald's and uh, Marvel movies. You know, they're not assimilating to that, and they just cling to those immigrant identities as they reap the benefits from America. And then when something goes wrong in their homeland, they demand that Captain America comes rush and save them. And I, I really don't like it. Uh, the the It's very jarring. Whenever I see this stuff, I'm like, you know, go back home. <laughs> you know, what the hell are you doing here? Like, stop demanding we do something for you. And it's like, you know, this is America. This is not your ATM machine or mercenary force. This is a real country. And stop black using moral blackmail to this. And that's why I've, I've talked about it in the program before. It's like, I'm tired of these Ukrainian MPs coming on our programs and crying and demanding, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. My cat is so scared of going outside now. Please uh, start World War Three for me. And it's just like, shut the fuck up. Like, this is our own country. We're not, we're not waiters for you. Figure out your own problems. And I know a lot of this is due to our own leaders giving you bad advice, but you know, we're not starting World War III and risking our American blood for your own little problems that are going on thousands and thousands of miles away that are no concern for America. And America getting involved in these conflicts and getting subjected to these um, immigrant moral blackmail about what's going on. It's like, that's not our problem. That's been, but it's been the source for many problems. You know, what it reminds me of is, you know, when I went to one in December, I went, or maybe it was like in November, is one of the uh, million MAGA marches. It was in, Dece I think it was in the one in December in DC. Maybe it was the one in November. I can't, re I can't fully remember correctly which one it is. And on the highway, there were all these Indians, you know, actual Indians who were having some farm protests about something in India, and they were clogging up the, the traffic. 
that was in D.C. Uh, over some farm protests over an issue that was going on in India. And I was like, what the hell is this? This is America. Why are you guys protesting over something happening in India and clogging up our traffic over some farm agricultural issue going on in India? And they all had flags out, all had their cars uh, dressed up and like waving their... Um, it's some particular region. It was like the it was like definitely one of the the Punjab region or whatever that was there. They had their flags out and that was their thing. They were protesting. I was like, "What the hell is this? This is America. Get the hell out!" <laughs> and that's like my knee jerk response to this stuff. And that re reminded me a lot of these protests we're seeing in favor of Ukraine around the United States. The next thing I want to talk about the Ukraine conflict is the media demands that America be happy to pay higher prices in order to help out the people in Ukraine. And this is really funny of how they're just trying to push the propaganda uh, to the max here. And I don't think it's going to work. This is going to be finally a white pill that's going to be offered is that Americans are going to be pissed is that they were fine with the Ukraine conflict when it meant just changing their, you know, Facebook profile picture to Ukrainian colors and, and saying, I stand with Ukraine. As long as it meant no sacrifice or no cost to them, they're fine with this. But now when we already have inflation as a major problem, the White House is telling people they're going to be happy to pay even higher prices for gas to help freedom. And so it's like very jarring for ordinary people that they can remember not too long ago, you know, just less than two years ago, paying less than $2 for gas. And now they're going to be paying $5 for gas. And the White House is trying to tell people to be excited for how much they're paying for gas. And of course, there are a few brainwashed people are going to go along with this. But you know, there is no call to sacrifice. And people want to be like, well, we did this in World War II. Uh, yeah, we were f having our own soldiers fight in World War II. And people had like, you know, an understanding of what we were fighting for. Like people don't know where Ukraine is. They don't know much about Ukraine. They just see a social media fad that's going on. And they're like, oh, yeah, I guess they're fighting for freedom. But whatever. I'm going about my ordinary, uh, my ordinary business. And now they're going to see, like, why the hell am I paying $5 for gas? And, you know, well, it's all Putin's fault. And, you know, they've already seen gas prices go up further. You know, food prices go up. Rent costs go up. I don't think rent costs is going to be impacted by Ukraine. But, you know, food and gas prices obviously are. And they're just being told to eat shit and, and, and be happy about it. And they did this with inflation that, you know, they were trying to at first say inflation wasn't real. And I had a tweet saying, like, you know, they're going to convince people, they're going to convince half the population that inflation isn't real because they're going to get fact checkers out to say inflation's not really real. And then that didn't work. And they're just like, oh, inflation's temporary. And then they realize inflation is not temporary. And they're just like, well, you have more money now. So it's a, not that big of a deal. We're helping out the economy. It's a sign of a strong economy. And they always laugh at this stuff. You know, whenever they get Jen Psaki or you know Kamala or whoever, they're always laughing about this. They always treat this it, it, as a matter of complete contempt. When they've been asking Jen Psaki about this, at the press conferences, every time she's just like sneering, dismissive of this, it is like her being asked like any question that she just doesn't want to ask. Like it's a, something extremely annoying that you would dare ask her this question and that it's really rude for you to continue to insist on this and that the real American people, namely the people of the State Department, are extremely happy to be paying these high, high gas prices in order to help out Ukraine. And so it's just not going to work, but they're going to try the hardest with this as they're, you know, it's like we have a clown show that is uh, going forward with this. It's like I've always, always wanted to say, it's like the people that, you know, I made this point last week, I cannot emphasize it enough, is like how much these people at charge are complete clowns that we cannot trust with anything. And they're calling us a sacrifice. It's imagine like Jen Psaki and Kamala Harris demanding you to give up your life for the people of Ukraine. Like, what level of, like, uh, brainwashing would you have to do to even consider that as a legitimate idea? Like, these people are total jokes. Like, Kama, anytime she speaks about Ukraine, it's so funny when they put her on cameras. I mean, the Biden administration must be doing this intentionally to ensure that she can never become president and cannot run against him in 2024. Because anytime they put her up, it's just like uh, her just, like, spitting out platitudes that mean nothing. She's like, ah, you know, honey, uh democracy is important it's important 
And, uh, you know, Ukraine is, like, fighting for freedom. And, um, you know, that means something. And it's like, you know, sending to, to like, these Polish guys who are just there. And she's like, dudes are nervous. Like, ha, 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 ha. And it's like the Polish guy is like, oh, we just accepted two million immigrants and <laughs> refugees. And she's like nervous laughing. And she's like, like, this is not somebody you would trust or have any confidence to like even lead like a bathroom cleaning option project, much less, <laughs> you know, the a world, a world nuclear power like America. And it's just like this, just like clowns in charge. I'll actually get to this. I'll get to one of the uh, cognitively questions here because somebody asked about this, and I might. I have another topic to talk about before getting to the other cognitively question, so I'll answer this one right now. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the cognitively option at highly respected Substack, and that's at highlyrespected.substack.com. And make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements while you're there too. This question comes from Jay, and it's about the ruling class, and he was asking me to clarify uh, some of my opinions about them. And he's like, is it fair to say that you that your view of the managerial ruling class in America is they have drunk their own Kool-Aid in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and as a result have become incompetent slash not serious? And another point is maybe at one point Jews in Israel were not allowed to be criticized by the left, but now they are routinely accused of white supremacy white supremacy by the left with little to no consequences. Um, the two, you know, just asking and clarify, both of those, I wouldn't necessarily say they're correct. Um, the second, well, the first one, I think that they do have drink their own Kool-Aid and they do believe that diversity is our greatest strength. And the more diversity you have, the stronger you are as by saying like, look at how strong we are that we have Kamala Harris, the uh, the first black woman as vice president. This is just a real threat to the world. And they really do believe that diversity is a strength. And whether that is a cause for them being incompetent, not serious, I'm not quite sure. Because as I've said, all the maniacs of the maniacs uh, who are Russia experts would have been considered Russia experts just by their credentials and who they are, like McFall, Applebaum, uh, Yaffe, and, you know, David Frum, I guess, is treated as a Russian expert now. And some of these other people, they would have been probably treated just on their credentials and background as Russian experts at 30, 40 years ago. But what they're saying, I think most people would have been like, this is nuts. And they would have been told to be more sober-minded at that time is more the culture around it. I think that a real cause of this is that the marvelization of our discourse has made these experts appeal to it, you know, and the people that they're bringing on. And also by them saying the most bombastic things means that they're going to get on TV programs more and get higher ratings. And that's what brings them back. If they're smart, sober, Slightly boring people, they're not going to be invited on TV programs. If they're bombastic, saying stuff that sounds like it was straight out of a Marvel movie, they're going to be brought back time and time again. It's like Malcolm Nance, who is this complete clown, has no real security, <laughs> no business being a security expert, but MSNBC loves having him on because he says the most bombastic over-the-top stuff that gets them ratings and is what lib libtards want to hear. And so it's more that the type of discourse that we suffer under in America that privileges uh, outrageousness and hyper hyperbole that these guys are now we have these clowns who are just completely incompetent and not serious on our television program, such as Michael McFall going on and saying, like, not even Hitler was as bad as Putin, and then him being, you know, he's a professor, an academic, who's saying, oh, I didn't realize that Hitler did bad things to ethnic Germans. I, I, I would love to learn and be educated. It's like a white guy learning he has white privilege. It's like, I want to be learn and be educated. And it's like, your field of specialty is modern European history. <laughs> You know, well, I think that you should already know these academic works and stuff. It's like you're an academic, you're a professor. Like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, you should know this stuff already. Like, you're you're not like a white guy who's just suddenly learned that black girl magic is real, and I love to learn more about this. This is like your field of specialty or near your level of specialty, a related subject to it that relates to a lot of what you've studied, and you're just sitting here. It's like I would like to learn more it's just but it's just like him just trying to come up with an apology i mean some of the incompetence is their obsession with diversity is that they're elevating people who should not be in these positions such as kamala 
<laughs> some of the uh, Black Congressional Caucus we see and others that they like elevate these people to positions they can't have. I mean, it's an effect of affirmative action. So I would say, you know, it is an effect, but maybe not the sole cause for it. The second one, with Israel, I would say little to no consequence, like criticism of Israel. That is more true. Jews, that's a separate topic. No, I don't think that. I mean, you could even see, even with Whoopi Goldberg, she did get punished for that, uh, for her statements, you know, on the Holocaust that offended uh, Jewish Americans. So I don't know necessarily say that's true. But with Israel, I do think that's true. And even like these hardcore neocon hawks who have now moved to the left on our move to the left in light of being never Trumpers, people like David Fromm and Bill Crystal. When it comes to Israel, they're much more nuanced now. <laughs> like in 2014, when like there was a eruption of hostilities between the Israelis and Palestinians, like these guys were total bloodthirsty, like maniacs, like demanding like them like carpet bomb, like uh, the Gaza Strip and all this stuff. And now they're just like, hmm, I think, you know, Israel's acting a little too aggressive and, and there needs to be nuance here. Like I'm thinking like David from and Bill Crystal in this stuff. And so that is like, a, you know, them bowing down to how the mainstream media is reacting towards it. I mean, the last summer, the mainstream re media's reaction to that conflict that erupted between the Israelis and Palestinians was unprecedented in my lifetime, like the way they covered it. And a lot of that, that they were willing to see Israel as the bad guy and you know there were Congress there's prominent lawmakers calling them an apartheid state and you know New York Times and Washington Post publishing op-eds saying the same exact thing you know that is a real change and there's not the consequence for uh, criticizing Israel uh, as a figure or minimum now if you're a corporation because like republicans love passing these anti-bds laws you know ben and jerry's you know you'll have like florida and wyoming I, maybe wyoming try to ban ben and jerry's but they're they're trying to ban ben and jerry's if you're like a company or something I and mean, you do have to you know corporations have to compared to black lives matter and gay rights they have to be uh, more uh, circumspect about you know supporting Palestinians, but only I think only Ben and Jerry's is wanting to do that. I don't think anybody else is. Uh, I don't think McDonald's is going to start waving a, a Palestinian flag in solidarity with the Palestinian people anytime soon. So there is a change on that. Uh, so yeah, on those things, just clarify. You know, there's partially true on both those statements. I wouldn't necessarily say those are my statements. I mean, the obsession with diversity is a contributing factor to making our elite not serious and incompetent. And when it comes to Israel, yes, you can now criticize Israel uh, for in mainstream commentary and mainstream politics with little to no consequence. But not true for the right. I think the one thing on the right is the right is... Not the distant right, obviously, but the right itself is becoming more pro-Israel, if that's even possible. I mean, you, back in the day, you had a lot of libertarians who were willing to criticize Israel. I mean, Ron Paul, Rand Paul. Rand Paul's still around. Uh, but if you're even looking at, you know, there was still Republicans, even in random Republicans in the 90s and 2000s who would say, uh, critical things about Israel, but it re and libertarians were big on criticizing Israel too. But libertarians no longer really do that, and it's more that they're complying with the guidelines of the rest of the American right. So that's something to say. But when it comes to Jews, no, I mean, no, it's like it's similar with most protected categories. I mean, it, it is going to be labeled hate speech, and they do still care about that. But when it comes to Israel, it's a, you know, diff, very different from 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago when discussing this subject. Now on to a different subject. It's actually going to be talking about the domestic propaganda machine that works against Americans. And, of course, I'm going to be talking about the uh, alleged don't say gay bill in Florida. And what this does is that it prohibits uh, sex education for third, from for kindergartners to third graders in Florida. I don't think they were learning about sex education at, at the moment, but it's ensuring that they're not going to have sex education in that. You would think that this would be an easy victory for Republicans, but no, the left has turned their propaganda machine against Ron DeSantis in Florida over this, and they've turned it into saying it's an anti-gay hate bill, and it's like, don't say gay. And whenever they try to defend it, they're just saying, no, all it does is prohibit you know sex education and the teaching of these topics to 
kindergartners, first graders, second graders, and third graders, while well, like everybody else in Florida schools can learn about this, these subjects. Uh, so it is, and the you would think that the public would be on the side of DeSantis here, but a public opinion poll show, I did share this. Now, people always want to say like, well, public opinion polls can be wrong. That is true. They can be wrong, but... N- they're generally uh, more on the mark. They're not completely the reverse, unless it's sometimes leading questions. Like whenever people are asked about amnesty, immigration amnesty, it's always phrased as this. It's like, do you support mass deportation or do you support a plan that makes immigrants get to the back of the line and pay their fair share in taxes and eventually they get a legal status? And then, of course, they're like, oh, well, The second option seems reasonable. I support that more than the first option. And that's how they always get this, like, uh, majority supporting amnesty. But when it's actually phrases, you know, just a straight deal, like support legalizing illegal aliens rather than, like, giving them a choice, you know, generally the numbers are more accurate. Now, with this question, it simply asked, do you believe that, uh, do you support bans on the prohibition or bans on teaching uh, sexual identification or sexual identity and gender orientation or yada, 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 yada to, you know, elementary school kids. And 62% uh, oppose those bans, 37% support. Maybe there was some confusion on this. Maybe they thought that the, they thought that the bans were, you know, they didn't understand it was a ban and they thought that they're like, they support like the ban, but they got confused. But it's probably accurate that a majority of Americans uh now unfortunately oppose these bans and this is like a real change it's like i kept putting the like i had two like fairly viral tweets pointing out these changes on on twitter first i said is like you know 10 years ago <clears throat> nearly every state over 40 states had a ban on gay marriage and california was one of those states that banned gay marriage i mean a majority of californians voted to ban gay marriage in 2008 and now 10 years later you know, uh, a majority of states now require or cannot prohibit the teaching of LGBT indoctrination to elementary school kids. And that's such a massive change that's going on in American society. And another thing that you could do with a poll is that in 2009, 57% of Americans opposed gay marriage. And now 2022, 62% oppose bans on teaching, on indoctrinating kids with LGBT lessons in elementary school. And this is like a sudden change on gay, uh, on, on gay issues from even when I first got into, you know, politics uh, as an adult, like eight or nine years ago, is that I remember clearly is that conservatives at that time, the things they were saying about gay marriage is like, this is a threat to civilization. This, you know, this is going to end our way of life as we know it. This is a direct threat to America. And we have to oppose this is like uh, a marriage. Traditional marriage is the backbone of our society. And that immediately disappeared with the Supreme Court decision in 2015. It's, you know, gay marriage has not come up as an issue. It's just like overnight, the American people acquiesce to the fact that gay marriage is now legal and it's just a fact of life in America. And there was no real resistance to it. And you could see it's very much different when you could compare like, you know, Supreme Court deciding to end segregation in 54. There was uh, at least... uh, (laughs) You know, 10 to 15 years of resistance towards that decision a very fierce resistance. And the Supreme Court decisions, both in 2013, which knocked down uh, the Defense of Marriage Act and in 2015 that uh, prohibited bans across the nation, uh, bans on gay marriage, state bans on gay marriage. You know, the 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 response was just like complete acquiescence to it. And it's going this with a lot of the gay issues is that if you guys, even if you look at social conservatives and when they talk about LGBT stuff, it's now been relegated to just defending girl sports against, against, uh, you know, transgender athletes participating in it. That's like pretty much they've all just been reduced to is that, 10 years ago, they were fighting against gay marriage and even fighting against same-sex couples adopting kids. Now the largest e- evangelical adoption agency works with works with gay parents to adopt kids. You know, this is a position that they strongly fought against five years, even five years ago and within, uh, you know, the, the era of the Trump administration. And now they've just submitted to it. 
And now we're at this point where a lot of conservatives are doing this, you know, passing these bills, you know, the like prohibiting sex education um, in schools and they're finding resistance to it. One funny thing is you got to remember is that one of the ways that they've made the West hate Putin is that Putin uh, put a similar type of bill in Russia where they tried to prohibit you know, what they call gay indoctrination among kids. And he was turned into a pariah and it's like an anti, a huge homophobe that was trying to, uh, committing a hate crime against gays for simply saying like no gay indoctrination in schools. And it was like, I think all schools in general, not just kindergartners to third graders. And now we see that in America, they're trying to do that. A lot of these people just hate Putin as well. And they, I mean, Florida is going to do it. I mean, uh, DeSantis has already signaled he's going to vote it into law, regardless of what Disney says. And I don't know if other states are going to follow this example because they're also seeing the type of, you know, the backlash that they have. And it's like an easy symbolic victory of this stuff. And you, you have to w- wonder is that, you know, if the public is against it, or at least the majority of the public is against it, like, what does that say about the public? <laughs> And even conservatives have totally changed on gays. I mean, there was a time where, like, being an openly gay conservative was a problem. Now, like, op- being an openly gay conservative is, like, is like a, it's like a perk. It's like it's going to be a boost to your career. I remember when gay guy, I almost called him Gay Benson, but Guy Benson is this Fox News nobody who doesn't say anything interesting, came out as gay in 2015. And all these conservatives like, we're so happy for you. This is so awesome. This is great. And it's like, this is so awesome that there is so much uh, appreciation for gay couples among conservatives. And now we're seeing this at this point in time that a lot of the resistance towards the gay stuff is, uh, I think the best example of this would be Spencer Clavin, uh, Andrew Clavin's son, who does stuff with like Claremont. I think even with Daily Wire, who has his own podcast. Him and his husband are, I I think he might be married now, or he's at least engaged because he made a big point about showing off how he's engaged. And they are him and his him and his husband are defending uh, girl sports against the scourge of transgender athletes is where the conservative movement is at in terms of combating LGBT issues that like that's like the that's the penultimate scene that would happen if if we're talking about this. The only group in America that. Real that still a majority of them oppose gay marriage is evangelicals. I even think of Mormons, maybe Mormon. I don't know if Mormons were assessed in this polls, but Mormons have completely surrendered as well on this, probably more so than evangelicals because they were leaders in the fight to ban gay marriage in, in California. Now they've like apologized for that. And you, you don't, you don't know, I don't know how that tide's going to turn on the LGBT stuff because it's just like kind of progressing that like. People say that this is a slippery slope, but the slippery slope keeps getting like faster and going down more. And then like there's like a new like conservatives just like I take always a rear guard action is like they the dam burst when they gay marriage happened. And now they just like uh, we're going to defend religious freedom and then religious freedom. They completely lost out on. I mean, when Mike Pence tried to sign a religious freedom bill in 2015, right before they legalize, you know, they. Uh, abolish bans on gay marriage throughout the country, you know, corporation says we're not going to support Indiana and they caved in and a lot, you know, they caved in on religious freedom. Nobody talks about religious freedom bills anymore due to what happened to Indiana and every corporation threatening to boycott the state if they went through with it. So that broke. And now that, you know, they, then they may have had same sex adoption, um, couples adopting that broke. And now they, you know, there was maybe allowing, you know, gender reassignment surgery among kids. They're still sort of fighting on that, but there's like cracks in it. And a lot of Republican governors are more hesitant to vote for that than they are to talk about girls, you know, transgender athletes and girls sports. And that's really like the last fight, even much more so than the bans on gender reassignment sur- or whatever they want to call it for kids. And, you know. I know a couple of states are fighting on that, uh, and those are like the last two fights. But you can already see even the cracks in the in the dams on that fighting, and you really are at the point where you know conservatives themselves are pro gay in much of their respect. You know, nobody, none of these mainstream conservatives talk about gay marriage anymore. None of them talk about like same sex couples adopting kids. I mean, you'll still see institutions like the Catholic Church and. Uh, 
adoption agencies run by the Catholic Church still refuse to go along with those type of adoptions. You know, there are still some institutional resistance against it, and a lot of churches are not going to officiate gay marriages. But as a you know, society as a whole, like they've come to acceptance of this, and conservatives themselves are like love their gay commentators. They congratulate anyone who gets engaged or married in a, in a gay relationship, and you know that's at the point. And so, I like turning it around. I don't know what's going to like. This is one thing. Maybe, maybe I always try to offer white pillar optimistic advice, and this. I am not sure what's going to turn the tide. Maybe, maybe there's mass religious conversion. Uh, maybe that makes people. But then again, then again, a lot of these churches uh, are like really pro-gay. I mean, every mainline church, uh, almost nearly every mainline church in America is very pro-gay, and even a lot of evangelicals are taking a more nuanced uh, perspective and tact on when it comes to gays. So I don't know really what would make people like reverse their positions on a lot of these issues. And I don't think it's going to come from the next generation. Some people say maybe Zoomers are younger, but I actually do believe the poll. Some people always dyked out the one in five Zoomers identify as LGBT. And I have to agree with that. I mean, like young women are now loving to identify as bisexual and more, you know, these schools are encouraging kids to come out more. And you have to remember that even when I was in high school in the 2000s, you know, people still bully kids who are, who are, who are considered gay or, or, or effeminate. And I can only imagine what would happen if you call like some kid like gay or, or use some slur for him. And like what would happen to you? You'd probably be expelled from school. So they probably crack down on it. And, you know, schools like are more open about having gay student, uh, gay straight alliances. I remember when there was a gay straight alliance in my, in my high school and everyone, everyone made fun of it and like really came down hard on it. But now it's like the school's probably going to endorse a GSA, um, than they, than they would have, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I don't really know what's going to happen with that, but I do think we do need some clarity about these rear guard actions and getting really worked up about, about, you know, trans, athletes and girls sports or whatever it, you know the fight on, on the on that front is already lost and there's going to have to be a real civilizational change uh in, in our country and throughout the west for that to you know to be rectified and i don't you know and i see i'm very white pilled about other issues that are coming up like you know 10 or 15 years ago, no one was talking about anti-white racism, and now that's a mainstream issue. 10 or 15 years ago, people weren't talking about restricting legal immigration. Now that's a mainstream issue. And a lot of other things, in like the the dissident right having a voice in the mainstream, you know, that wasn't apparent even 10 years ago. But at the same time, when it comes to gay issues, it is, you know, just completely, you know, going in a in an opposite direction of what a lot of us want us to wanted to go. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, my full thoughts on this are, you know, maybe for need to think over it for more for an, another episode. But it's something I just want to point out. So I think the, you know, Florida bill will succeed. But I think when it happens, I don't know if other states are going to follow the lead. And they, and a lot of states also get, you know, queasy about going following along the lead, even with banning transgender athletes about girl sports, which seems to be like the least. Uh, offensive to liberals uh, fight that the the conservatives are waging at the moment. So we'll have to see about that. I mean, this is kind of a black pill, but it's something that I think we need to realize and understand. Now on to the rest of the cognitively questions, as I'm going to do my pitch again. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or, or, or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Cotton Elite option and highly respected Substack at highlyrespected.substack.com. And make sure you sign up for the, for the IQ supplements if you have not already signed up for them as well. We're going to have another great episode this week. We're going to have a special guest on, so I hope you guys enjoy it. It's somebody I've even mentioned in the show who's going to be on. And I've been holding off on this episode because of news developments, but I'm finally bringing back... And so this question is, it's actually something that deals with a lot, actually what we talked about in the last IQ supplement. This one comes from Adam. He says, hello, Scott, with many U.S. companies pulling out of Russia this past week, I wanted to ask whether or not some of them could be good in the long term. What I think he's meaning the pullouts could be good in the long term for the Russian people. 
And then he saw this as like, you know, um, he's like, I saw this after seeing this post. And the post was this horrifically morbidly obese a Russian guy who is apparently a son of a famous artist in Russia. He himself is a pianist, Luka Savernov. And this guy handcuffed himself to a McDonald's saying this is infringing on his rights and oppressing him by McDonald's leaving Russia over the Ukraine strike. And, you know, you could say that, like, you know, maybe without McDonald's, there would be fewer obese people. There won't be people like Luka Savernov. So maybe there will be this benefit. But, you know, as I talked about with the guys on last week's IQ, some of the guys from Russia's with Russians with attitude is they thought this would be ultimately long-term good because it'll create more independence from the West for Russia and Russia will be able to develop its own companies that are more in line with, you know, their conservative values rather than these conglomerates from America or the Western world. And, and they can develop their own things and be less dependent on the West and they'll have more freedom of action by ending this dependency. And there'll be fewer obese people. So maybe there might be some... Uh, you know, silver linings here for the Russian people. I also think is that, and I talked about this with the Russians with Attitude Guide, is that a lot of the, you know, the people who are most enjoying these services are the people who already hate Putin. It's like the libtards who live in the cities and <clears throat> think that Putin is, dis you know, disreputable. But like the people out in the countryside and the smaller towns don't necessarily get these benefits uh, as do uh, Luka Savernov. So, it may not even have that much of a popular backlash to losing McDonald's or, or Pizza Hut or KFC. But I have heard it's like, like people are complaining that who I know of Russia are saying that the KFCs and the fast food restaurants in Russia are much better than they are in America. They've been in America and they're like the KFC in Russia is amazing. And I think this is a real sign of American decline is that our best fast food joints are in foreign countries and not in America, while our fast food joints in America continue to decline. And this is a real sign of civilizational collapse. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, this question I held off from last week, and there's going to be a long discussion about it because it was asking me about a movie. So I'm going to read it for you right now to make sure you guys get the full extent of the question. This one comes from Ben Gino. It's actually a very simple question. It's like, hi, Scott, if, when you see the new Batman movie, could you give your thoughts on it? It's quite good, according to Ben Gino. Well, I did see it this week, it, last weekend, actually, and I have a lot of thoughts about it. I'm still processing the movie. I pretty much thought I saw it on Saturday night and pretty much the rest of the night and even Sunday. I kept thinking about the movie and to like what I thought of to fully flesh out my thoughts on it. Uh, I would say the first thought the first two thoughts i would have is like i did enjoy seeing it the last movie i saw in theaters was dune i did an iq supplement on it see i'm doing a lot of advertisements for iq supplements here so that's you got to sign up for them and i did enjoy it more than dune i don't think i really enjoyed it there was like a lot of cool parts but i mean the main problem with the movie is that it's it's three hours long and it's a superhero movie there is no reason it should have been three hours long. There was so much unnecessary uh, fluff to it and excess that it should have been cut down to just two hours long. I think the exact running time is two hours and 47 minutes, so they should have cut off 47 minutes and made it two hours long. There's just so much unnecessary fluff to it, and it's like they're just trying to make a movie epic, and it especially became a problem in the last like hour or so because you're just like there, and it's like... They could end the movie here. They could end the movie here. It's like they really dragged out the ending, the like the last like forty minutes of the movie way pat way more than they should have because there was like there's I don't, I'm gonna give some spoilers away. I, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to do that. There there's a part where they finally catch the Riddler. And they made the catching the Riddler really unnecessarily long. And then they're like searching around his apartment for no reason. And they made that scene unnecessarily long. And then, like, they could have just immediately, like, gone and got the Riddler. The scene of getting the Riddler was made, like, five or ten minutes too long. And then they could have immediately got the Riddler and had the Riddler talking to Batman, sharing the rest of his evil plan. And instead, they have, like, a huge delay in that. And then they... <laughs> They, they, th to the Riddler having this plan, he has to then go back to the Riddler's apartment and find out his evil plan, which takes an unnecessarily long amount of time. And then the plan 
doesn't even really make sense. It has uh, uh, this huge natural catastrophe for Gotham City. Then in the end of the movie, they're just like, oh, well, <laughs> what? we're moving along. It wasn't that big of a deal. And it leads up to the final scene. And even after the final climax, you know, where Batman saves the day, saves Gotham, he... The, the ending is then dragged on even longer. And you're like, what the hell? Just end this, end this damn movie. We've been here way too long. And they would refuse to end the movie. So I would say those are the two uh, problems with it. I So I did enjoy it. But with that and me enjoying it in mind, uh, going with the problems, other problems of the movie besides the length, I think one thing is that it, it is a movie that tries too hard to be dark and gritty. Like, you know, if you're looking at this in the Christopher Nolan movies that were claimed that were dark and gritty, those look like PG movies compared to this. Like this movie, it's like they really push the limit to a PG-13 rating. They even have the, they even use the full extent of the two F-bombs that they're allowed. And you, you're you allowed to use the F-word twice, I think at, at most twice in a PG-13 movie to retain their uh, rating and also there's an implication of very gory violence that they don't necessarily show but they you know it's like heavily implied of what happens there's a particularly gruesome death that happens to one of the riddler's victims that you would definitely never see take a kid to this to this movie like i would say this like you know most superhero movies are designed for children and this along with joker is like a movie that you could never take a kid to and you have to uh, people probably wouldn't remember this, obviously, but in 1992, when Batman Returns came out, which didn't have the level of violence and it didn't have these like gruesome torture death scenes that are being committed by the villain, there's very mature themes in the movie. But people complained about how this is not a movie for kids. And McDonald's, which had a which had a toy tie-in with the Batman movie, was heavily criticized for this. And the backlash against the Batman Returns for being too adult was the reason why Tim Burton got sacked from directing any further Batman movies. Because they're like, this is too dark, this is too mature, we don't have this. And now the new Batman is like, <laughs> would have been darker and more grittier than like Predator 2 or like the big like R-rated movies from the early 90s. <laughs> and just the level of violence and, and, and they really go over the top in trying to make this dark and gritty and serious. But at the end of the day, it's still about a dude in a bat suit. And there's like a really serious scene where he goes and inspects a crime of uh, one of this crime scene of one of, you know, the Riddler's victims where he brutally murdered. And <laughs> he's there and it's like very serious scene, but he's in a bat costume. And you're just like there and it's like he's also going against a guy named the Riddler. Who is based on like the Zodiac Killer. I guess they try to make the, the, the Riddler a little bit more realistic than Batman. But like there. And then they, like even with the realism and grittiness and darkness of the movie. It's like Batman could be shot point blank by a shotgun. And just be have the nit wind knocked out of him. <laughs> like he, he bullets just don't work on him. It's like well his bat suit is like super bulletproof vest I guess. I, they just explain it like that. And he gets shot by like every type of firearm in this movie. And none of them have any. I mean the shotgun has an effect on him. But it just knocks the wind out of him. So it's like it's like you you have this dark gritty movie that's supposed to be realistic and at the same time like the hero is able to, <laughs> to have a take a take a shotgun blast and easily survive <laughs> and just take an adrenaline rush to recover. Actually best of all is he's blown up <laughs> one scene but he's just temporarily temporarily knocked out no broken bones or anything he's just kind of lose you know he just gets a, a, a slight concussion from it. <laughs> And another thing, in spite of being all dark and gritty, is that Batman still is like, oh, no, I'm not killing. And it's like, if you really wanted to make a dark and gritty Batman, you would have him kill. And, you know, the Tim Burton Batmans, Batman did kill. And I think that's what one of the things that makes it a more mature work than even this, which, you know, has gruesome death scenes and, you know, everything's covered in darkness and there's references to drugs and, and drug abuse and, and corruption. And it's like really trying to be really seedy about how Gotham is, is that ultimately the, the Tim Burton ones are more mature, especially with their themes. You know, there's not really many themes of this movie. It's never explained like why Batman is doing this, why Batman doesn't kill, why, you know, Batman is the way he is, is like they did 
Nolan and Burton definitely went more into trying to explain like these things to you know audiences and like the creation of these characters and how they came to be. While like this is just like assumes that the audience knows what Batman is and they just don't need an expl explanation on this. But you kind of do need this because it's like a, a new director's interpretation of this uh, of a character, and you know you're trying to create this you know dark and gritty uh, Gotham, but you're having your your Batman is the same as like the cartoon Batman. And that's and that's what the Batman is. And there's not really any more themes. He's like he does have this like the people of Gotham are good. It's it's very much a replay of what you saw in the Nolan movies about Batman. And it's just now it's given less attention and they're just like more focused on like this gruesome death scene or or something like or, or this car chase or this uh, action scene or something are the are the mystery that they're trying to solve and there's like all these kind of plot twists that they try to do and there's like there's nobody who's good because bruce wayne's dad turns out to have you know some uh, a dark side to him and this goes on and on and on now, when it comes to the wokeness of the movie, some people are pointing it out, like Catwoman at one time talks about these privileged white men who run Gotham and they suck and Catwoman herself is mixed race. Uh, I mean, I was about to say black. I don't think she's only like a quarter black, but um, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite certain about that, but she's mixed race. And then the mayor is, or the new mayor is black and she also has like an Afro style that looks like she's about to deliver a Vox video about white supremacy and how whites have ruined the white supremacy of mayonnaise. Like that's like how she looks like, of like her look that the mayor has. I think the mayor is the most woke element of the movie is like the, just like, oh, she's the one fighting against corruption and she looks like the uh amanda gorman you know the teen poet laureate that delivered the speech at biden's inauguration that everyone loved and like oh we love amanda gorman gotta have more amanda gorman and this is what the woman looks like in the movie and that's what it's trying to evoke and it's very much woke i mean commissioner gordon is black i i talked to some people who are like oh this is too woke and it's like you don't really notice it <laughs> like it, even though it's played by jeffrey wright who's been who has attacked me on twitter uh, i cannot remember that i was like i cannot watch a movie of some guy who's been so rude to me on social media but <laughs> he plays it you don't really notice it at the end um the one thing is like they're trying to make this more authentic is that the police officers all try to have really thick New York accents, which they didn't even try to do in the old Nolan movies. But these guys are just like, and the mustaches and their and their physiognomy, they really try to nail down for the police officers, even much more so than they did in um, the Dark Knight series with Nolan. That's just something to consider. I mean, but it's like Commissioner Gordon's like the one who's not talking in a thick New York accent, but he, he fits the role. I don't think it's that bad. Uh, but outside of the woke stuff, like, I think it's, like, less bad that Batman, it's not like Batman is committing to woke, is that they have to do these things in order to be a part of the culture now. And so people have pointed out that, like, every non-white character is a good guy, while, like, all the bad guys are privileged white men. And even the victims of the Riddler are designed to be like the stand-ins for what you would view as like the white privilege calendar and he's like and he's murdering and humiliating them in a way that it's like yeah take it to the white guys and so you're supposed to not be as sympathetic for these guys as you would you know an ordinary victim because they're privileged white assholes and so it is what it is while meanwhile every non-white character who appears in the movie is a good guy and everyone who's working with batman to save the city the mayor, Commissioner Gordon, and Catwoman, they're all non-white. And so it gives that impression in similar ways to Dune. I know I'm comparing this to Dune, but it's like the last blockbuster big movie I've seen in theaters. And it was also displaying these traits of all the good guys in the movie are non-white. And then the bad guys are white, even though the main character in both movies is a white guy. Uh, you know, who could be, <laughs> it, you know, the people he's siding with for the most part are non-whites. And, and Dune, it's the Fremen, who I don't know if it's yet been a, a conscious decision to make sure that they're all black or Arab and Middle Eastern or Arab and North African, but that's how it portrays. And it, and then the Sardaukar and the Harkonnen, I know this is blending two subjects, so you may not know who these guys are. Those are the bad guys. They all look like 
uh, Northern European and, and the Harkonnen look like uh, just bald Slavs who are speaking some language. And then the Sardaukar look like these Nordic barbarians. And so it creates the impression that this is an anti-white movie because they're the colonizers against these POC Fremen. And that may it may be unintentional and it may be a part of that they just have to have these diverse casting choices now because Hollywood has set the quota for film studios to do this, especially with big, big budget movies. And I think that's the same that happened with Batman is that I don't think it was necessarily intentional that they had these choices. But it comes off that way that, you know, the bad guys and the victims that we're not really sympathetic towards are all these privileged white men. And then everyone who's working with Batman is a non-white person. And it creates the impression in the mind that the culture really wants us to think is like POC good, white's bad. And it's less that Batman, the people behind Batman are intentionally doing this. It's more that they have to do this in order to accommodate the current culture we have. So... It's a it's kind of a black pill to think about. That's like all the movies, but if, but but on itself, like this is much superior to Marvel movies. Um, you know, I, I am I am interested to see what else they'll do with it. I am I will say I'm looking. You know, I might be soy jacking. I might be. Oh my god! That there's gonna be a sequel. Um, there's one scene where I was like, oh, this is designed to make people soy jack. I won't give it away. I'm sure you've seen it, but you know, it's when Riddler is at Arkham Asylum and. You know, somebody else starts talking to him, you know, and it's designed for like soy jack. Oh, I know who that is. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then they're, uh, they're doing that. But, yeah, it's a nice alternative to, to the Marvel movies. And like, you know, it is good to see like a big budget movie that is at least entertaining. I mean, I think if it was shorter, I would be more positive about it. Like I because there are like some really cool scenes in it and you know it is free of a lot of the goofiness and cringe of marvel movies and it's not really that woke except for the impression that's created by the casting choices as the same way that dune was as well as well now how does it stack up against previous batmans as those as true greer heads would know I don't think the Nolan films are superior to the Tim Burton films. I think the Burton films are far superior than the Nolan films. One, Batman is not a complete simp for a six in in the uh, in the Burton films. You know, he's not Rachel. I don't know Rachel. I remember when I saw Dark Knight in theaters and all the way back in 2008. Uh, I remember when Rachel was about to be blown up. I was like, this character sucks so much. And then when I found out like she's gonna be the one blown up, I was like, yes, yes, all right. Yeah, Batman, stop being a simp. And then in the third movie, he's still a simp for Rachel, even though she wasn't into him. And it's just like, that's so cringe. While like Michael Keaton is a is much more of a playboy billionaire who is into that. And it's also like the Nolan movies are really trying to take themselves very seriously. While like the Burton films like acknowledge that this is a dude in a, in a bat suit. But at the same time, it's not as cartoon and it does have a cartoonish element and and like a wildly unrealistic element. But it also is more realistic depiction of human behavior and nature than the Nolan movies. Like even though the Nolan movies are trying to be super realistic and now the new one even more realistic and darker and grittier. It's at the same time, the people in it aren't real people. I think it's the the ultimate scene in, in The Dark Knight when, you know, Joker is, is expecting one of these two boats to blow themselves up. It's the one with if one of the boats has like the good citizens in it. The other has criminals and neither one blow themselves up because they know that would be wrong to to go to blow up and kill anyone. And Batman says, like, yeah, the, you underestimated the good people of Gotham, that they're fundamentally good. While the good people of Gotham are not good in the Burt movies, like he had, like Batman is an aristocrat who realizes the masses are idiots that he has to save them from themselves. Like in the first movie, Joker lures the people out with uh, with money and like gets them to like start hot fighting each other over money so he can gas them. <laughs> and in the second movie, Penguin nearly convinces all of Gotham to elect himself mayor and basically Batman has to save themselves from it. So they're not fundamentally good. There are just like these masses that are doing these things. And even like the type of motivations of the villains, they're more realistic about the revenge and like the pettiness of, uh, of the, and the kind of the sordid nature of humans that they're trying to engage in. Their behavior is much more realistic than the villains and any of the characters 
in the Dark Knight movies. Uh, you know, it's like Penguin has, you know, was an abandoned child and his main dream is to get revenge on the, the true firstborns of Gotham City by killing them. And that's something else. And there's also kind of a, you know, a, a humor side that has also appealed to high culture that would never be found in the Burton movies or in the Reeves movies is that when Penguin dies and Batman returns, he's then marched off by his penguins to the tune of Siegfried funeral march from Wagner's Goethe Damerung. And it's like, it's like a very funny scene, but it's also like, it's like a scene that could have never happened in a modern uh, comic book movie. Cause they're like, what is this music? Like, why are they doing that? It's like a, such a ridiculous scene, but at the same time, it's also making an allusion to high culture that no comic book movie would ever do. And now the, like the music that's played and it's supposed to be serious, like letting you know, this is a serious movie is something is Nirvana, something in the way in the Matt Reeves movie. And just like, I, when I heard, it, I was like, Oh my God, I just began laughing. It's like, Oh my God. But like, it's supposed to signal to like the ordinary Americans. Like, wow, this is just such a serious movie that this guy's like Kurt Cobain. Oh my God. Like Batman is, is so much like that. And so, yeah, how does it, so long story short, the Burton movies are still unequaled by or unrivaled by this, the new film. How does it compare to Nolan? I think The Dark Knight did not age well and Batman Begins is just not a good movie. Dark Knight Rises is still pretty good. I would have to rewatch it again and I would have to rewatch this new movie to see. I never saw the DC Universe with Ben Affleck and I have no intention of seeing them. Uh, so I wouldn't, I don't, wouldn't know to compare with that. And the Joel Schumacher movies are terrible. <laughs> so, uh, not even as good as camp. Like they're just really bad movies. Even though I love Batman forever as a kid, they're, they're not good movies. So comparing that with it, uh, I do think it is going to be interesting going forward. You know, the Nolan movies have a lot of weaknesses and the dark Knight itself does not age as well as you think. Dark Knight rises is better. And, whether Dark Knight Rises, Dark Knight Rises is simply better than the Batman by being shorter and more concise and less filled with excess. And so I would still say that that is it. But I think the direction that Reeves is taking it into could make for a better movie than Dark Knight Rises. We'll have to see. And so I enjoyed the movie. I would recommend going seeing it. But as I said, the main problems with it is the length and too much excess and Maybe it's trying too hard to be serious and dark. And at the same time, it is a dude in a bat suit, which the 10 Burton movies will always be superior is that it weaves immature themes into the, into the movie and has a realistic depiction of human nature and human and human motivations. But it still acknowledges that this is a movie ultimately about a dude wearing a bat suit. So, and that in mind, this has been a longer than normal episode. And I know I talked about Batman for a long time. I could have done a whole IQ supplement on it. But I think that would be too excessive. We may have an IQ supplement on Batman movies soon enough. And we will talk about some of the Batman movies and the IQ supplement coming up this week. So tune in for that. So until next time, stay respected.